Good morning. Yeah, continue to pray for Pastor Tony. Uh, I've known Tony longer than most of you probably, and uh, we've been good friends for a long time. And uh, so I encourage you to pray for him. He's gone through a really rough time, as, as many of you know. Do you ever wonder if it's all real? If God really does exist? We're going to try to answer that question this morning as the scripture points to a surprising place that we can get encouragement. Because the creation screams for the reality of God. Let's pray together. Open our hearts to your word this morning. Encourage us. Let us be humbled as we consider the greatness of your world and the even greater reality of you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Hear the word of God. <clears throat> The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And now verse 19, what may be known about God is plain because God has made it plain. God has revealed himself to everyone. He's saying if people do not believe there is a God, it is because they refuse to believe there is a God. If people do not believe there is a God, it's because they have suppressed the truth. That they will look at the evidence, and as you look at the evidence, I think you'll see more and more the reality of people suppress the truth. People look at the evidence and say, I won't believe it. God has purposefully revealed himself gloriously. There are several scriptures that indicate this. Let me look at just a couple of examples. Psalm 19. It's one I think of a lot. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. The heavens are talking to us. The skies are preaching to us. A few years ago, Lola and I were in New Hampshire in the, in the White Mountains in the fall. And, uh, oh, the glory of the foliage in the fall in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Now, we see it here as well, but it was just overwhelming. The glory of God just, just ringing through the valleys there. There's a biblical science lesson every day. There is no speech or language where the voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, the words to the ends of the world. No matter where you live... Or what language you speak, God can talk to you. Because he's talking to a universal, with a universal language of the reality of the beauty and the wonder and the glory of creation. The world screams of the existence of God. Now there's other places in the scripture from a little different angle where we see God is very intentional in giving us evidence of his existence. God wants us to know. Verse, Luke verse 20. 2 verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The shepherds saw the angel. It was evidence. The shepherds heard the angel. There was evidence. The shepherds went and saw what had been proclaimed to them. There was evidence. And they came back proclaiming the glory of it all. We see it again in the resurrection. The other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail hands, nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. 
So what does God do? What does Jesus do? He shows him. He doesn't say, Thomas, if you don't believe, then you're out. Thomas says, I want to believe. I want to know. Show me. And God shows him. God wants us to see. Can one prove the existence of God? Not what we would maybe like. I have a quarter in my pocket, but I'm not going to dig it out because uh, the microphone thing's in the way there. But if I told you that I have a quarter, I could prove it to you by going to my pocket and pulling out and say, here it is, I got a quarter. Now, I can't prove the existence of God that way. But there's a lot of things in this world, including in the, in the world of science, that we believe by evidence, not because we can see it as we would like to see it, but we believe it by the evidence that's there. Uh, I believe overwhelmingly in the evidence uh, 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 that, that gravity is real. Uh, I, I don't like heights. And the reason I don't like heights is because I know gravity is real. I'm convinced of it. I have the evidence around me, and I don't want to make more evidence in, the, in my own life. God reveals himself in miracles all over uh, and, and throughout the scripture. Why are those miracles recorded? So we would see, so we would know, so we would get the example of what God does marvelously in the lives of people. Now, I want us to understand that when you become a Christian, you are not asked to give up your mind. You are not asked to give up thinking. You are not asked to say, okay, I, I, I don't understand this, so I just won't think about it. I've, I've seen people who refuse to deal with things that are troublesome in science because they just don't want to know. God asks us to know these things. He wants us to understand. Matter of fact, God commands us to know. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think about things. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Luke 10, 27, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. God wants us to think about things and know him from that way. Verse 20, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. God is saying through Paul that from day one, he has been showing the world that he's real and that he's powerful and that he is in charge of everything. There's two kinds of revelation. There's general revelation and special revelation. Special revelation is the scripture itself. But general revelation is when we look at the world, we look at creation, we look at the things around us and we say, look, there's God. There's God. There's his glory. There's his power. We see his power. We see his divinity all revealed in the creation around us. Man has no excuse for not believing in God. When one insists on the infinite variety of this world to ignore the evidence that's around us, it is because one has determined that they will not believe. Have you ever read about the actions of a honeybee hive? Just amazing. Just amazing. I don't have all the information here this morning. But there's like 50,000 bees in a honeybee hive. And each bee will make less than a teaspoon of honey in its life. And bees live only a matter of weeks. But somehow those 50,000 bees, which are constantly turning over to be new bees, somehow all know their job. Can you imagine 50,000 people being turned loose on a job <laughs> with nobody telling them what to do? Somehow they all know, and there's all this structure and harmony and wonder in this beehive. And it, some amazing ways that they communicate with each other, where they tell each other where the nectar is and how far away it is. They don't have any writing. They don't have any GPS, whatever. It's amazing what a honeybee does. How about monarch butterflies? Do you know that monarch butterflies fly up to 3,000 miles to migrate to the south? Monarch butterflies can't even fly in a straight line. <laughs> but they'll travel almost 3,000 miles to, to, to migrate. 
I'm told that there's a place in New Jersey, maybe some of you have heard of it, that, that you can go at a certain time of year and you can see the, the, the flock of, of monarch butterflies come through. I would love to see that sometime. I think it would be just amazing to see. This morning, as I was going over my notes, I looked at the window and a hummingbird was humming by our, by our hummingbird feeder. Amazing. Hey, hover there. <laughs> you know, and I don't know why they go this way or that way, but they go. And uh, then they'll hummer as, uh, hum, hum, hover as they drink from the hummingbird feeder. And then once in a while they'll sit. And this morning, this one, I don't know what was going on because he sat on the top of the crook. And he was back and forth on the top of that crook for like at least five minutes. Usually they there a little bit and they're gone. So I don't know what was in his mind this morning, uh, but he, he stayed around for quite a long time. Amazing beings. And I don't know, probably, maybe some of you know how, how fast those wings go in one second. But they go multiple times in a second. It's amazing, a hummingbird. How about uh, uh, birds themselves, other birds? Uh, where we used to live, there was a, a uh, bush right outside the den window. And every year, a bird would make a nest in that bush. Now, I don't think that bush was so attractive that different birds chose it all the time. I am told that that was the same bird every year that flies how many miles south with no GPS, and is not following a map, just flies south, and then when it's time, how I know, who, now, who announces it's time now, but it's time, they fly north, and he flies back to that same bush. Why is there order in creator in creation? Why is there so much structure and order in creation? It's because God is a God of order. It's amazing. People think that out of chaos came order. That they think that the world was created in chaos, and out of that chaos came order. Or we know as we look at, at, at creation, we look at the things around us, it tends more the other way, doesn't it? That there's order tends to drift towards chaos, at least in our own interactions. The stars at night. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and uh, I hope some of you had the opportunity to be out in uh, the dark, away from the ambient light that all the cities have, and see the stars. And you talk about a star-spangled banner, you've got to look at a star-spangled night. Oh, my. It is just amazing. I have a, a friend who uh, would host uh, students from overseas uh, who were attending the Language Institute at the University of Delaware. And she said one night they were standing on their deck, and they live in a pretty dark area, looking at the stars. And this person said, I did not know. I did not know. Amazing, amazing. Now, if the stars are amazing, think of the canopy of the skies. A clear blue sky. And you look into that clear blue sky, and you look into it, and you start to wonder, how far does it go? And when you get to a wall, how thick is the wall? And when you get on the other side, how far does it go? I mean, our mind says there has to be an end someplace. But we look at it, we know there is no end someplace. The divine glory of God, an infinite universe. And then we contemplate the human mind, the combinations of will and dimensions of faith and aptitude to learn and endless creativity and expressions of love and so many things. We see the eternal power and divine nature of God. The world screams to the existence of God. Now, perhaps you think this was all fine for the time of Paul. I mean, in the time of Paul, we didn't, science didn't know that much, and so we rested upon a belief in God to understand things because we couldn't understand them other ways. And, and so since science has kind of made so many progresses now, maybe we don't need God so much anymore. If you start to really look, that doesn't hold true at all, does it? Not true at all. Understanding what is not the same as understanding how or why. There's so many things in science that we know what happens. Those bees, those hummingbirds, those butterflies. We, so many things we understand what happens, but we don't understand how or why. We can understand some patterns. We see some structures. We see the bees do this, the birds do this. We say, oh, there's a migration in there that's, that's uh, innate, whatever. How or why? 
So many things we don't understand. how We don't even know how things hold together. Except the scripture says God holds it together. Never fear what science discovers. Never be afraid of what science discovers. General revelation and special revelation, science and the scripture will always agree. It'll always go together. If it doesn't agree, either we're not understanding the science correctly or we're not understanding the scripture correctly. They'll always agree. And I tell you, be ready to look at the scripture again as well. Don't just say, well, I know the scripture and so it has to be science. Understand both. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of Galileo, who was convinced that the sun was the center of the universe when the world and the church said the earth was. And that got Galileo in a, in a lot of trouble. He's, he was charged with, quote, vehement suspicion of heresy. Just short of heresy. Vehement suspicion of heresy. And so he was charged to renounce, quote, with sincere heart and unfeigned faith, his belief in the sun being the center of the universe. He had to say, ah, I renounce that. Church wouldn't, but we were kind of convinced now that the sun's the center, aren't we? Took a while, but we're kind of convinced of it. So never be so certain of the scripture uh, that you understand the scripture. I'm certain, be certain of the scripture, but don't be certain that you understand it all correctly. Be ready to look at the scripture and the world and science to put those things together. The more science discovers about the world, the more evidence for God will appear. The more science discovers about the world, the more evidence for God will disappear. I have a grandson here this morning. Uh, he didn't know he's going to be called out. <laughs> he's going, what's the grandpa going to say now? You know. It wouldn't surprise me that if in his lifetime the Big Bang Theory is debunked, that people no longer believe in it. It'll take a long time because people will suppress the truth. The scripture says that. They'll look at it, they'll look at the evidence and say, I won't believe it. And that's happening now. It's happening now. But I think as the science proceeds, the evidence will become so overwhelming that the Big Bang Theory does not work. That it'll be debunked. There's parts of the theory of evolution that make some sense. Whether that all debunked or not, I don't know. There's parts of it that makes sense, that you understand it. But the origins thing does not make sense. Let me read you something from Eric Metaxas. He was a speaker and an author. And uh, he wrote something in the New York, uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal back in uh, 2015. Wall Street Journal, 2015, Eric Metaxas. In 1966, <clears throat> Time Magazine ran a cover story asking, is God dead? Many have accepted the cultural narrative that he's obsolete, that as science progresses, there is less need for a God to explain the universe. Yet it turns out that the rumors of God's death are premature. More amazing is that the relatively recent case for his existence comes from a surprising place, science itself. Boy, microfave, microphone on my nose, huh? <laughs> and it's published to YouTube. Here's the story. The same year Time featured the now famous headline, the astronomer Carol, Carl Sagan announced that there were two important criteria for a planet to support life. The right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Now, given the roughly octillion, that's one followed by 27 zeros, given roughly the octillion planets in our universe, there should have been about one septillion, that's one by 24 zeros, planets capable of supporting life. There was the probability. With such spectacular odds, the search, for extra, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, a large, expensive collection of private and publicly funded projects launched in the 60s, was sure to turn something up soon. Scientists listened with a vast radio telescopic network for signals that resembled coded intelligence and were not merely random. But as years passed, the silence from the rest of the universe was deafening. Congress defunded SETI in 1993, but the search continues with private funds. As of 2014, remember he's writing this in 2015, as of 2014, researchers have discovered price precisely bupkis. That's zero followed by nothing. 
what happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were far more factors necessary for life than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, and then to 20, and then 50, and so the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schinkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skept uh, Skeptical Inquirer magazine, in light of new findings and insights, it seems appropriate to put excessive euphoria to rest. We should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. It says it doesn't work. As factors continue to be discovered, the number of possible planets hit zero and kept going. In other words, the odds turned against any planet in the universe uh, supporting, and include, uh, supporting life, including this one. Probability said even we should not be here. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. Without a massive planet like Jupiter nearby, whose gravity will draw away asteroids, a thousand times as many would hit the Earth. The odds against life in the universe are simply astonishing. Yet here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfect by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that science suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions require far less than faith, than, far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds to come into being? In other words, it's more likely, reasonably, to say that God did it than that it had just happened. There's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared to the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, now I don't know these four fundamental forces, so don't be surprised that I say them, okay? As the astrophysicists now know that the values of the four, mental, four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang, if there was a Big Bang. Alter any one value and the universe could not exist. All these four things, a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, any one value, the universe could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the nuclear strong force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest fraction, by even one part in one with 17 zeros, no stars could have ever been formed at all. No stars at all. Feel free to gulp. Multiply that parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads 10 quintillion times, 10 quintillion times in a row. If I could get my quarter out, maybe three times in a row, maybe five, maybe 10, but 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 quintillion, it wouldn't happen. It doesn't happen. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken at these developments. He later wrote that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with the chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Theoretical physicist Paul Davies has said that, quote, the appearance of design is overwhelming, quote. And Oxford professor Dr. John Lennox has said, quote, the more we get to know about our universe, see, the more we get to know, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation as to why we are here. The greatest miracle of all time 
without any close seconds, is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that ineluctably points with the combined brightness of every star to something or someone beyond itself. God is real. The earth screams it. O oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. How great thou art. Lord, may we be humbled before you this morning. Because on top of all this, we have the revelation of your holy word. So if we have doubts this morning about who you are or that you are, Lord, may those doubts be attacked and put down. Lord, I pray for the power of your spirit upon uh, scientists across the world today, that they may not suppress the truth, that they may look at the evidence and be overwhelmed. And may it cause us to worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.